Uh, welcome to our session. Uh, we're ready to begin. Good morning. I am Nate Lichty. Or good afternoon. Hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. I'm Nate Lichty, uh, Managing Director of the Housing Trust Fund, and I'm your moderator. I'm delighted to introduce our presenters. Uh, the workshop that you're in is uh, Preventing Displacement and Building Wealth Through Community Land Trust Home Ownership. And I'm pleased to introduce you to our presenters, uh, Julie Brunner with Opal Community Land Trust and Kathleen Hosfeld, the Executive Director of Homestead Community Land Trust. At this point, I'll turn it over to you and I'll monitor the chat for, com for questions. Thanks so much, Nate. Julie, do you want to introduce yourself? Say a little bit more about who you are. Okay, I think Julie has frozen. So, Nate, can you still hear me? Yeah, you sound good. Okay, great. Well, then I'll I'll tap dance and and do my introduction. Uh, I'm the executive director at Homestead Community Land Trust, which is based in King County, Washington, and we have um, a trust of 223 homes uh, that it's created 253 first time home buyer uh, uh, experiences, and um, I think Julie's just getting set up again. Um, so I'll wait. Um, Julie, are you ready to introduce yourself? Or Yeah, can you guys hear and see me again? Sorry about yes. that. I just lost my connection. So hi, I'm Julie Brunner. I'm with Opal Community Land Trust up on Orcas Island. Um, I am the housing director there, and uh, I'm also a housing consultant. So I work in different areas across the state and the country in that capacity as well. So thanks for joining us today. Great, thanks. So uh, what we're going to go over uh, in this session is we're going to talk about the evolution of community land trusts. We're going to talk about how community land trusts work and what we do. We're going to talk about anti-displacement and access to home ownership. And we're going to uh, touch briefly on CLTs at work in Washington and beyond. So I'll start with what is a community land trust? It is a membership-based nonprofit organization that acquires and uses land to benefit low and moderate income people in neighborhoods. And we most often see CLTs at work uh, creating housing, whether it be rental housing or home ownership. Um, Homestead focuses on ho affordable home ownership. Opal Community Land Trust has both rental and home ownership housing. The community land trust model got its start back in the 1960s in the South, in Atlanta, Georgia, to be specific. And uh, it was started uh, in response to an unintended consequence that came from uh, organizing in the South. Uh, civil rights era leaders who were working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were in Albany, Georgia, inviting people to register to vote. And uh, this was a majority black community, um, but uh, uh, blacks actually represented a very minor part of the voting rolls. So uh, when they signed up to vote though, when they registered, many of the black residents of Albany who had been sharecroppers um, were forced off their land. And uh, this resulted in them not being able to work and it resulted them in not having a place to live. Um, so at that time, uh, the civil rights era leaders were uh, talking, had been researching models that could strengthen the uh, black community and its ability to sustain itself. Uh, this uh, event tipped their hand to create the modern model of the community land trust that we have essentially today. And that model um, is collective ownership of land and individual ownership of homes, farms, and businesses on the land. The, the leaders created that original model, which has been passed down and improved upon to this day. But the original intention of it was to prevent displacement and allow people to build wealth. Uh, and it was brilliant at doing that at the time uh, and it was, uh, and, and it has stood the test of time in being an adaptable model that addresses uh, issues of displacement um, and wealth creation 
today. There are different reasons people get displaced today, um, not so much from registering to vote or uh, social injustice of that type, but um, but growth, uh, population growth, gentrification, um, those types of pressures, the community land trust model is uh, very well suited to address as well. So the essential owner elements of the community land trust are the dual ownership of land and assets on the land, being a non a nonprofit tax exempt corporation, having a place based membership, the members are from the area that the CLT serves. And we have a, an aspiration to have the tripartite governance, which is one third homeowners or people living on the land in the trust, one third housing professionals and one third community members. Obviously small CLTs that don't yet have homeowners or residents can't live into that tripartite governance. Um, so um, depending on where you are in the spectrum of startup, that might not be true, but the aspiration is for community representation and, and resident governance of the model. Um, there's also generally speaking, um, uh, an orientation towards active acquisition and development of land. It's not just a static placeholder for land that or a passive model. It's a it's intended to be active. And the final essential element of the community land trust is that its intention is to remain to create perpetual affordability of whatever assets are on the land. So in King County, um, this model is used to address home ownership. Um, because King County is very expensive, uh, one of our high cost areas in, in Washington state. Um, you can see uh, the in the chart on the right, the change in home ownership prices just between 2014 and 2021. Um, you can see uh, almost $300,000 increase in the value of a median home. Um, and then this, this bar below that is the uh, price that would be affordable to the median household. So here you can see really dramatically what the everyday reality is that um, even the median household income can't afford the home prices that are in King County, uh, much more so than people who make less than 80% of area median income. That's the gray bar down, down below. These are the prices that are affordable to the people that community land trusts often serve. Um, and you can see that there's, uh, we had a $200,000 gap in 2014, and uh, now we have an exponentially higher uh, gap in uh, 2021. So, and what does that mean in Seattle? Um, in real dollars, here are some uh, income levels for different folks. So, and we judge that by household size, obviously, uh, a, a three person household, they're, max income for, to qualify for our program is $81,000 or so. That's a, a medical technician, a nurse, x-ray technician, teacher. Um, then you get your, your single family households, which the upper limit is about 63,000. So that's a firefighter salary, cable technician, you know, transit driver, gas utility worker. These, uh, we show these examples in part because these are the people that make our communities run. We need these folks. We need them to be able to live in proximity to their jobs. That creates quality of life for all of us. Um, and it's it's only fair that they should be able to live and enjoy the cities that and communities that they make great. So um, so we focus on home ownership um, and it, with the prices in the ranges that you see in the orange um, stacks on the right, uh, comparatively, we bring the price of homes down to that affordable level, which is um, roughly uh, at least half or um, even a third of the uh, price, depending on which geographical location you're looking at. So what do we do um, as community land trusts? We either build new construction or we rehab uh, existing homes. We fundraise to subsidize the price of those homes to what is affordable to the folks we serve. At the first sale, the land 
underneath the home is split, the title is split, so that the land is owned collectively by our members through the trust and the individual home is owned by the home buyer. Owners then lease the land for uh, from us from the from the trust for a small monthly fee, and they agree because they're getting a, a opportunity to buy a home at way below market. They agree to resell at a formula price that restricts their equity gain, uh, but allows them to pass on an affordable price at the next sale. Said a little differently. Community Land Trust Home Ownership subsidizes that initial price as the home goes into the trust, but then it controls the future cost increases through agreements with our buyers. And we use that ground lease to, as uh, the agreement between the home buyer and the Community Land Trust, to ha have agreements about what, how we are partnering together to make and keep this home affordable. Um, we use ground leases when there's dirt underneath the land, uh, under the home, but then when the land is shared, such as in a condominium building, we use a, a covenant. So buyers purchase the structure of the home, uh, but not the land. Uh, typically, they do a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Um, Removing the value of the land from the purchase is, is part of what makes it affordable, but in some places, especially in King County, we are subsidizing the cost of building the home as well um, because the costs are so high. Then, as I said, the land is owned collectively through the CLT, um, and the, the ground lease spells out the responsibilities that the homeowner has to our program and that we have to them um, and, and contains the resale formula um, that helps keep the home affordable. The community land trust model uh, works with all home types. Uh, sometimes the, the um, assumption is that these are all single family detached homes, but in fact, um, we do have scattered site uh, single family homes in Community Land Trust, but we also have um, townhomes, cottage homes, duplexes, row houses, condominiums. Um, so you name it, we run the gamut of different home types. And the Community Land Trust uh, model today is positioned in a larger context of, um, of trying to create a regenerative economy. Um, it fits in with the just transition to a new economy um, in that the land under our homes is community owned and controlled. And there's a democratization of wealth. Um, homeownership, uh, homeowners are active in both the membership of, homes, of CLTs, but also in the governance. So serving on our board. And then obviously we're achieving racial and social equity by putting homeowners, um, putting home ownership within reach of people who've been shut out by discrimination and, and in our area, runaway housing costs. Um, but the intention is to remove land from the speculative market and put it under community control. Um, and that's, that's in part, uh, uh, a regenerative dem democratic governance of the land, and it's also um, essential to keeping homes affordable going forward. We think it's important um, that we address the racial and social equity aspects of this work. Um, we are trying to address uh, the legacy of a racist housing and transportation policies and the disparities that they've created in home ownership rates. Um, we've had redlining, block busting, restrictive governance, restrictive zoning, um, highway systems built to isolate black people or to take advantage of underinvested land. Um, and the negative outcomes that we've experienced are over-policing, disinvestment in black and brown communities and, and displacement. Um, so when community owns the land and controls what is developed on the land, um, we have the opportunity to prevent displacement. And the great thing about the community land trust model is that it can, uh, it can address both residential and commercial displacement as well. So that uh, the CLT model helps uh, make and keep 
a variety of assets, uh, real estate assets, affordable permanently. Affordable rental, commercial space, urban and rural agriculture, um, the community and, and cultural spaces as well. And uh, so we consider especially home ownership in the, in the community land trust model, um, an anti-displacement strategy. This map that you see in front of you is a heat map of, um, of Seattle plus um, uh, King County over to the right. There's a little call out of uh, large uh, places in King County. Where, wherever you see the black dots are either where individual homes are or where we are developing new homes in King County. And you'll notice that they are located in places that are considered at risk for high displacement. The red um, or, or dark orange indicates um, areas that have been deemed risk of displacement. So once we establish a permanently affordable home at a location in, in one of our service areas, I like to say we're giving affordability a permanent address at that location. And through resales uh, over time, new homeowners will come in, but they will still be that low income uh, uh, household that um, participates in our program. And that means that communities will be have housing forever that addresses the widest possible spectrum of, of incomes in the community. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Julie. So I get to take you all through some of the real life numbers and statistics and examples for um, both Homestead's program there in Seattle King County and Opal's program up on Orcas Island. And I have some national data that I'm going to share as well. So I just want to start by saying I love numbers. I'm a spreadsheet geek. And so it was all, it's always a pleasure and a joy when I have an excuse to dive into some numbers. So I pulled out a couple examples, um, one from Kathleen's program and one from my program. So, and these are real life examples. These aren't made up numbers and they're not made up. Um, we're not giving you names and addresses, but they're real life examples. Um, and I also just wanted to say, um, Nate is, is grabbing questions from the chat and we'll go through those um, when we get to the end of the presentation. So please keep the questions coming. Um, so this is an example of a particular home buyer who bought their homestead house in 2010. They earned about $52,000 at the time. They brought or they had available about $2,500 in cash towards their purchase, which of course isn't, um, it's not a down payment, it's towards closing costs. They were renting at the time for $775, although the fair market rent for a three bedroom in Seattle at that time was almost $1,500. So Homestead has a, had a house um, available for sale, a three bedroom, two and a half bath for $204,000. Um, they could broker a deal with the $2,500 cash to close with some down payment assistance from the Washington State Housing Finance Commission to cover the gap between that and the rest of the closing costs. And the monthly payment for that home buyer was under $1,500. So around the same amount as the fair market rent, $1,460. And just to be clear that $1,460 includes taxes, insurance, and the small monthly fee that Kathleen mentioned that goes to the community land trust for stewardship and oversight and all those kinds of things. Um, and then their payment was just um, just right around a third of their income. So right in that target zone that we're trying to hit to make sure that the folks who buy our homes actually have an affordable payment. So then um, in 2021, um, this year, this person decided to sell. The resale price, according to the formula in her ground lease, meant that she could sell the house for $257,000. Um, to pay off that down payment assistance and her first mortgage, she had to pay off um, just under $177,000. The closing costs to sell are minimal because there's not um, commonly a real estate uh, agent involved since Homestead has a wait list and a buyer pool of, of eligible buyers. Um, so closing costs were minimal and cash at closing was in the $73,000 range or will be in the $73,000 range. So when we're talking about wealth creation and the opportunity for home buyers who were otherwise locked out of the market, this person came to the table with a $2,500 investment and 10 years later or 11 years later walked away with 70, almost $74,000 in cash. And in the meantime, had a beautiful, stable of um, home with affordable monthly payments that didn't change over time dramatically um, like the rest of the market has been transitioning. So then incomes, um, our next eligible family this year 
um, earning about $56,000. Fair market rents in Seattle are just under $2,700 for that three bedroom home, which is a little bit mind blowing, but not probably a surprise to anyone. Um, so Homestead's three bedroom, two and a half bath house now um, is selling for $265,000. And the estimated payment for that household is just over $1,500. Um, because interest rates are lower now than they were when that first buyer bought it, there's virtually no change in the monthly cost, um, even though the price has gone up a little bit. So I think you can really see the benefit, not just um, both of the permanent affordability and how um, you know, in a, in a market where fair market rents are $2,700 for a three bedroom, uh, you can buy a homestead home with a payment of just over $1,500. Um, and at the same time, that seller was able to build substantial wealth to go on to the next place in her life. So I, um, I'm, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the data. Um, any of you who know me, there's a, um, a, a system that helps us manage what we do. It's called Homekeeper. And it's a place where we have data about our homes, our home buyers. Um, and the subsidies that go into the homes and the properties themselves. So we were able to pull out some, some sort of data points to look at for how is Homestead doing overall. Um, and so it's, I started with just a little bit of demographic data. So most of their homeowners are single people, but they do have substantial two, three, and four person households, much smaller number of five and six person households. Um, the pie chart on the right shows the range of um, of home buyers, so that big kind of tan portion earn 50 to 80% of median, that's the largest, but they do have a, a not insignificant portion of people who earn less than 50% of median as homeowners in their portfolio. And that's the income at the time that they purchased their home. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see um, the, the households with and without children, seniors, and people with special needs or households that have a person with special needs in them. Um, and then we wanted to also touch on, look at sort of how is Homestead doing in terms of racial diversity of their home buying population and how does that measure up um, in terms of, you know, access to home ownership for minority populations in the general market versus um, Homestead's market. So the, the graph up in front of you right now are home ownership rates um, according to, to race. So the very top one, the biggest one is 63% um, of white households down to the so the lowest number you see on that is only 26% of, of Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders who live in Seattle are homeowners. So we wanted to compare that to what's true for homestead homeowners. Um, and you can see that 55% um, of the rate of homeownership for minorities for homestead is 55%. So 55% of the people who buy homestead homes are actually minorities or, or Latino families. So I feel like my hat's off to homestead for um, doing a great job on that front. It means that they're doing a, a good job, I think, of all their outreach and that sort of thing as well. So then we wanted to look, given that kind of backdrop of who are they serving, we wanted to look at, um, at some of the impacts. So those first two graphs are mimicking what, um, what you just saw in terms of the homeowner diversity um, with the minority being white. Um, and then um, dive a little bit deeper into some of the other data. So if we look at um, outcomes and impact, um, we've got, I broke it down into the number of years someone owned a home to look at really what are the average housing costs. And because there's a couple of different benefits to this, uh, to this home ownership for the folks who buy into it. So there's the wealth creation, which is important. And we wanna make sure that we're keeping our eye on that because if we weren't about equity, building and, and transform, transformational wealth, we'd be doing rental housing. And some of us do do rental housing. Opal, for example, has 80 rental units in its portfolio. But our focus is really this home ownership and this opportunity to give people access to this wealth creation mechanism called home ownership that they have pre previously been locked out of, as Kathleen talked about. So there's a couple benefits. One is wealth creation, but the other is stable and affordable housing costs. Um, and so I, I broke it down by year. So for folks who've owned their homestead house for less than five years, um, the average housing cost before their purchase was 920. The average housing cost after they purchased, so they stretched a little bit to get into home ownership, was just under $1,400. But the fair market rent at the time, the average time, which I think was three and a half years in homesteads instance, was $2,700. So far, far more affordable than the fair market rent. And then you can see that as time goes on. Obviously the folks who have been in these homes longer, the fair market rent for people who've owned the home, I think it was 10 and a half years was 1660, but their homestead house payment was less than 1200. Um, 
And then if we look at wealth creation, that's the other side of this um, coin, both the affordable, stay, the affordable payments, but also how much equity are people able to build and walk away with at the end of the day. So for those homeowners who own their homes less than five years, um, the average cash at resale was $32,000. And if you look at that compared to how much cash they brought to the transaction in the beginning, it's a 95% return over that, over that, that 3.7 years on average, I guess. Um, and then that's an annual rate of return of 26%. And then the longer the tenure, those figures, um, you know, they clearly, they go up. So folks who've lived in there 10 years or longer, the average cash at resale was 82,000, um, which was a 54% annual rate of return on their original cash at close. So it's a dramatic investment, um, a dramatic return on their investment. So I wanted to show one slightly different example from Opal. And so this is not as dramatic in terms of the equity building. Um, and this was a recent resale that we had. But when I sat down and looked at the number um, in terms of housing costs, my mind sort of exploded for a minute. So this is a homeowner who bought their house a long time ago in 1988. Um, at the time, she earned just over $13,000. So one day, the numbers we're talking about now are going to sound like these numbers in our context. Um, she had $1,100 cash down. Her rent at the time was $475, and fair market rent at the time was about $700. She bought a two-bedroom, one-bath Opal home for $95,000, um, and her uh, principal interest taxes, insurance, and fees came to $450, so slightly lower than her rent and, and dramatically lower than fair market rent. So then again, if we jump forward to 2021, she decides to sell her resale price that she's entitled to according to her lease is $147,000. She pays off her mortgage. And, and in this case, most Opal homeowners get financing through USDA. So there's some subsidy recapture and all, and she had some deferred mortgages. Um, her closing costs are gonna be about 5,800. She actually had some deferred repairs that she had to pay for because we wanna make sure that the new buyers are getting a home in good condition when they purchase their home. Um, and she's still gonna walk away with $40,000, which isn't as dramatic over, um, over that time frame, but it is $40,000. Um, and remember that she um, came to the table with $1,000 and she paid $450 a month for over 20 years to live in her home. So really, really affordable payments that only look more affordable as time goes on. Um, so then we have that house for sale to the next eligible buyer. Um, and in this case, it'll be affordable to buyers earning as little as $37,000 a year in today's market. Fair market rent um, in our market right now is almost 2,100. And the estimated um, PITI payment for this two bedroom, one bath house that'll be sold for $155,000 is just over $1,000 a month. So our, our house prices, our house payments rather, are about 50% of what people would, would find in a rental if they could find a rental. But we all know that that's sort of far-fetched in today's market as well. It's not just about affordability, but it's about availability, which kind of takes us to that stable housing um, argument again too. So then I got to crunch the same numbers for Opal that I crunched for Homestead, which as I said, I always enjoy. So um, for Opal homeowners, when they, if they've owned their home five years or less, um, the average housing uh, payment or for rent housing costs was 740 before they purchased their home and 810 after. So you can see over time, um, Opal's homes, people are paying roughly the same in their house payment as they were paying in their rent. Um, and in all those cases, the fair market rents far exceed um, what the housing costs were for folks once they purchased their home. And then again, on the equity side, we see, um, of course, equity go over, grow over time as folks live in the homes longer. Um, I mentioned we do have um, USDA recapturing some, some of the equity from folks when they sell. So for people who have USDA mortgages, the, the equity that they walk away with is slightly less, but then as you can see, their payments were also lower as a result as well. Um, so we feel pretty proud of these numbers, pretty proud that folks who are able to live in stable um, housing in a lovely neighborhood um, with very affordable payments, and then at the end of their home ownership tenure, whether it's three years, 10 years, or 20 years, um, walk away with some substantial equity. So there's, we're fortunate to live in a, in a state that has um, a, a, a pretty deep and rich network of community land trusts. There are active, um, 19 active CLTs in the state and four in King County alone. Um, I did a little surveying of all of us. We, we tend to have um, gatherings a couple times a, um, 
or every year, but we haven't had them obviously because of COVID. So I did some outreach to update these numbers. Um, and Washington CLT and leasehold programs um, have served over 1200 households um, in their duration in Washington state. Um, there's also deed restricted programs, which bring those numbers for a total up to 2,700 households that have been served by either leasehold programs or deed restrictions. But one of the other benefits that we didn't talk about much until the crash was the stewardship of our homeowners themselves. So in the market and, and during the time when, when you know, people were in foreclosure and really astounding um, numbers, during the whole life of CLTs and leasehold programs in Washington state, there've only been 10 foreclosures, um, which is a 0.8% foreclosure rate. And all but three of those units were recovered. So one of the real benefits of a community land trust and that leasehold legal structure is that we have the ability to step in after a foreclosure and bring the unit back into our portfolio because we own the land. So we have, we're in a unique um, negotiating position, even in the worst case scenario. So then I promised, I also looked at, at some of the national data. So Grounded Solutions Network is our sort of trade association nationally. And that homekeeper, the data hub that we use feeds up information to this um, national hub. So they're able to give us information about how are we doing as an industry nationwide. Um, so seven out of 10, um, Shared equity homeowners are first time home buyers. Um, over 99% avoided foreclosure, which is consistent with the numbers that we saw in Washington state. Our 0.8% foreclosure rate is pretty consistent with their less than 1% foreclosure rate. Um, the average earned equity is $14,000. So that's not the cash at closing, that's the earned equity, meaning the appreciation that home buyers recognize as opposed to their benefit that they get from making a monthly mortgage payment. Um, 95% of the homes are at resale or, or, or priced affordable to people paying less than 30% of their income towards their um, house payment for buyers earning less than 80% of median. So our resale formulas are effective in keeping the units affordable to their target populations over time. Um, and then the share of um, shared equity homes that are being sold to minority populations is increasing. I think that's a function of, of improved outreach and making a real effort to make sure that the policies are not having a desperate impact on any population. Um, and then six out of 10 shared equity homeowners um, move on to another market rate homeownership opportunity when they sell their, um, their limited equity home. So that's another one of those things that surprised me a lot as, as a practitioner in Orcas Island. I never expected our homeowners to be able to make the leap into market rate housing because, you know, or, um, San Juan County and, and King County flip back and forth for the most expensive housing costs in Washington state. But in fact, even our homeowners are able to make that leap because of our homeownership as well as other things that happen in their lives, clearly. Um, so um, I hope that we, we gave you a broad enough overview. This is a lot of information to pack into a short period of time, but now we will turn to the questions and thanks for those of you who submitted them. And um, maybe Kathleen, do we wanna just go back and forth and take turns? Sure. So I'll start with the first one. Um, so there's a, a question for Maureen. Can heirs inherit a, the home in a CLT? And if so, does the CLT do a new ground lease? So, yeah, so um, one thing that we didn't mention is that um, if you're starting a community land trust, there's a, a lot of model documents that are available through Grounded Solutions. So there's a model ground lease that you pretty much have to use if you're going to use any kind of conventional financing because it's been blessed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, and it has a provision in it that says that um, anyone can inherit the home. But if you are a, um, a child, a spouse, or someone who's been living in the home for at least a year prior to the person's death, then you can own and occupy the home without being income eligible. Otherwise, you could leave it to your sister or your cousin or whoever, but that person, if they chose to keep the home and not sell it, would have to be income eligible. Otherwise, the asset gets sold and the heir gets the proceeds. Great. And the next question is uh, about how are homes, CLT homes assessed for tax purposes. That depends entirely on the area where you're in. In King County, we have a wonderful tax assessor who has approved um, giving uh, a tax assessment, a property tax rate that's based on the leasehold value of the home. Um, that gives our homeowners uh, a bit of a break. Um, and the state uh, Department of Revenue has issued an advisory recommending that type of approach, but not all assessors um, uh, follow that that guidance. So uh, it would be great if we could uh, make that just a standard practice throughout the state. 
And it has gotten better um, locality by locality as after that guidance came out, but it does take some time to negotiate. And that's another really important component of affordability with these runaway housing values for sure. Um, so the next question was, um, let's see. Um, I can answer the one from Christina. Um, okay, go ahead. Deliberately engage black and brown folks to address racial equity. Yes. So um, we, Homestead in particular has partnership with Africatown Community Land Trust to do outreach uh, and uh, to support the sales of our homes. We have a partnership with Skyway, which is one of the last black refuges um, in the, in uh, Washington state. Um, so uh, partnerships for community led housing development and outreach to black and brown people is an important part of our value system. And uh, we do it as best we can with the size of staff and the resources that we have. So the next question is, since the CLT owns the land, are there restrictions on the use of the land, outbuilding fences, chickens, whatever? So um, the things about outbuilding fences, chickens usually live in the CCNRs. Um, so if it's a subdivision and we're building it, we, are, we actually engage the homeowners to create their own CCNRs. Um, which would include those kinds of provisions. But the lease does say that you do have to comply with whatever CCNRs are out there um, and are recorded and associated with your property. Um, we do include a short thing on ours about like cutting down trees if you happen to be in a neighborhood that doesn't have CCNRs or if it's a scattered site program. So sometimes groups will add something um, of that. And maybe I'll do the next one. Um, since it's rural, can you tell us about differences in how CLTs work in small towns and rural areas with housing shortages? And if any, Washington state CLTs are currently operating in such areas. So Opal um, is in San Juan County. So that's a rural area. Um, there's uh, the Meta Valley has a community land trust. Chelan has a community land trust. Walla Walla is um, not really, I mean, I don't know whether you call that rural or, or not. There's a city, but it is in a rural area by nature and they have a community land trust. So there are CLTs in rural areas across the state. Um, I think we all operate in much the same way in terms of, the design of the program, our outreach is going to be different, our stewardship will be different. It's a little bit easier in rural areas, I think, on some levels, because we know people and it's a smaller community. On the other hand, your geography might be a lot larger, which presents different challenges as well. I can take uh, Patrice's question about, um, we don't justify the low equity attained in these programs relative to large equity, again, by white, by market rate homeowners, I should say. Um, you're absolutely right that these homes don't accrue the amount of equity that a market rate home would would um, would benefit somebody at, when they go to sell. But uh, for our buyers, the people we serve, they don't have the option to um, to buy on the open market. And um, in order to serve more people and give them those first time home buying opportunities, we do restrict the equity gain so that there's a, a home uh, opportunity for the next home buyer. Um, most of my uh, homeowners in my program do go on actually to buy their home because they've gained, you know, 40, 60, $75,000 of equity. That's their down payment. Um, so we've seen uh, most of the folks that have resold in our program over the last year and a half have all gone on to market rate home ownership. So it's a strategy, right? It's something to get somebody out of um, subsidized rental or under market rental and um, leapfrogging uh, ultimately into home ownership in a way, market rate home ownership in a way they couldn't have gone before. So um, CCNR, sorry, I made a reference to CCNRs with the question about um, other restrictions on the home and CCNRs are conditions, covenants and restrictions and, and they're um, commonly recorded with subdivisions. So they're not so common in a city environment where um, you know everything's already platted and split up but they are pretty common in more rural areas and suburban areas. So what are the distinctions for rental CLTs? So one of the things, um, and, and I'm not sure, I, my guess is that this is a feature of a um, kind of a, a more rural environment, but we are the only housing provider um, in our community. So, um, so we have kind of evolved to respond to the housing needs that our community has, which means we do rental housing. We don't really do rental housing in a different way than a nonprofit in Seattle would do, do rental housing. Um, and in particular in Washington, but in some states, where, um, for example, in Georgia, if you do a tax credit project, 
the period of affordability for a tax credit project is literally 15 years. And on 15 years in a day, the rents go up and the ownership changes and it's a market rate product all of a sudden. And um, that's not true in Washington. So the distinction is less dramatic in Washington, but for communities where there are not other housing providers, um, we provide another option. For uh, the question about small CLT. So um, I'll, I'll throw it to Julie for, in a minute, but in terms of co-housing, there are um, definitely community land trusts that do co-housing models. Homestead is developing a condominium that will have a co-housing social structure. Um, but in terms of, um, we don't do tiny homes, if that's what you're asking. Julie, do you wanna talk about just smaller footprint homes in general? Sure, yeah, um, um, so Vashon also is another one that's done co-housing and Lopez Community Land Trust has done co-op housing on community land trust land, which is focused on smaller footprint, you know, in the five to 700 square foot range, as opposed to, I think most of our homes are in the 800 to 1200 square foot range. Um, so I think what we do is we look for housing solutions. I, I also think most people would rather not live in a tiny home than live in a tiny home, but if if you're able to provide a product at a lower point, price point because it's a tiny home, then you'll certainly be meeting a need and you'll be able to serve lots of people through that. Um, but in, in my community, for example, they're not, they haven't figured out the permitting yet. Um, so, um, so we're a ways from being able to offer something like that as a housing solution. Um, we all look at it and we all talk about it, but I haven't seen anyone actually doing it yet in the 400 square foot range. Let's see. What are steps a county can take to encourage the establishment of a local CLT? Um, well, one thing is is talking about it. Uh, com community land trusts are community driven, so they are grassroots uh, solutions that um, that need uh, the support of, of large institutions like government. Um, but um, Julie, what what have you seen that has so I can launched? I can tell you you can fund some some like exploration into um, the creation of something like that. So for example, I was hired by the city of Chelan as a consultant to come out and work with them to look at their housing needs and see if a community land trust would be a good fit. So some of the feasibility and and all of that kind of thing and 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 public meetings and education. Um, to, to Kathleen's point of getting the word out and seeing is that A, is there interest in your community and B, how can it be supported by the public entities? And another example is um, Walla Walla, which is a private group, but there's a couple county commissioners who are involved in the effort. Um, and they had a public meeting on Zoom in February or January last year and 175 people came to their public meeting on Zoom about community land trust. So when there's that kind of community interest and then there's also some government support, that combination is really meaningful. With regard to how, what support is needed to help um, CLTs be more widely used, there's a whole plethora of things, but from investing in your CLT in terms of the operating income that they have, that's one of the limitations of the model is that is that we don't make a lot of money off selling the homes, um, but uh, also then advocating for surplus land, zoning, uh, state housing trust fund dollars, uh, advocating for local resources um, that invest in home ownership specifically. So there's just a whole raft of things um, that folks can be doing. And I'll drop my, um, well, uh, Nate could actually pass our uh, emails on to folks if you'd want to follow up for more specifics on um, on the things that you can do to support um, community land trusts in your local area. So the next question is, um, what does um, tripartite governance look like in practice and how are decisions made within the CLT? So one of the things that I, I talk about sometimes is when I first learned about this, I thought it was brilliant. And that was, you know, 25 years ago or something like that. And I, I sort of preached the good word about tripartite governance and membership. And, and, and I, I believed in it, but I never, I hadn't watched it um, perform in, in personally yet. Um, I mean, I knew organizations that did it, but I hadn't been directly involved and I hadn't seen the risks associated with not having that built in. So um, one of the things I think is really true is, so, so the tripartite governance um, for all of us includes a third of the um, board membership is made up of homeowners or people who live in community land trust housing. So we don't have any renters on our board, but we're working towards that because we have rentals in our portfolio. So the people who actually live in our homes help govern an organization. Then, then a third is general membership because we're a membership-based organization. Um, and then the, 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 the final third can be designed in different ways. So some groups have that be sort of 
you know, housing professionals or, um, you know, a combination of, of local government representatives or a variety of things. Um, Lisa Byers, my boss, likes to define ours as publicly minded individuals. So people who are coming at this from the perspective of the community good. Um, so that's kind of, and, and most of us make decisions by consensus. Um, recognizing that, you know, uh, making sure that everyone's voice is heard and that that everyone has an opportunity to participate in that decision making. So those are two things. And then I just say one more thing about membership, which is that, you know, Orcas Island Opal Community Land Trust is sitting on millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of land, just like Homestead is. And it's really important that there be some check and balances um, so that we don't have a self-perpetuating board without anyone in the community who can call us on, on the decisions that we're making. So we take the membership seriously and we take the tripartite governance seriously. And it means that what we do, I think we do better and, and more in the interests of our community at large. I wanted a question uh, to respond to um, a question that came up about what's the difference between community land trust home ownership and permanently affordable homeownership. And I appreciate the question. Permanently affordable homeownership is a more inclusive term to get to that, um, the housing outcome uh, that we have been talking about, which is making sure that homes are made and stay affordable resale after resale for the people that we serve. The difference between, uh, and, and permanently affordable homeownership can include community land trusts, it can use, include Habitat for Humanity, uh, um, leasehold programs, it can include co-ops. Um, there's a variety of community ownership models that could be uh, could fit that. Local governments doing deed restricted programs. Deed restriction, yeah, like Arch, yep. So that all fits in in that permanently affordable home ownership model. The thing that Julie just talked about in terms of the tripartite governance and the community ownership voice and um, being accountable to the community, that's what separates the two models. Um, so that's the chief difference. So how can a county government start a CLT through donation of a land, for example? So as I said, I think what the county government can do to, to facilitate it is to you know, see who's out there in the housing market or in the housing and the nonprofit housing world in your community and start a conversation. And if there's nobody out there in the housing, like if you don't have, if you're a small rural community, for example, and you don't have anything like that, then start a broader conversation. Um, with a promise of resources, right? So if you have something, I mean, one thing a community land trust is not is a single subdivision. Um, and, and it may be that that's what your community needs and that's all it needs. And then I would encourage you to look to other partners and see how you can work on a permanently affordable housing solution in your community. Um, but if you really are thinking that a community land trust is the right answer for your community, see who the partners are out there working in the housing space, who might be interested. And when I worked in the Metal, for example, they were quite interested in doing this. It started out of the um, long-term recovery board after they had some fires. And there was all these gauged, engaged um, nonprofit um, partners, but nobody was going to raise their hand to be the community land trust. So they actually incorporated a new entity and started from there. But it was with a lot of support from community members, from businesses, and from um, the nonprofit sector as well. With the support of government, you know, kind of backing it up in terms of we, we can we can support this on the on the funding side, we can support it in terms of land donations, all of those things are on the table. So Nate's suggesting that perhaps we close with just um, a highlight of a, a recent buyer that was important to us or, or a personal anecdote. Julie, do you wanna share a recent homeowner story? Well, yeah, so this is a good one. So we have, I had the um, pleasure, so I'm the person who works with people to get them actually into their home. And I had the pleasure kind of, of going through some of our older neighborhoods to meet with people after a resale happens to find out how did the trend, how did it go for them? Is it what they expected? Those kinds of things to get feedback for our program. And in the process of that, I was, you know, I was going house to house that the, the neighborhood had had, you know, maybe three or four resales in the past couple of years. And I realized that what we were actually doing was not just providing stable home ownership for the folks that I was meeting with, but they by extension had been providing housing opportunities for people in their lives because they now had stable housing. So it was a single mom and, a do and who had a baby who bought a four bedroom house. It was a little bigger than she needed, but it was available and she needed housing and she could afford it. So she bought it. And then she rented the extra bedroom to a coworker who needed housing. 
Um, so we were actually, you know, by extension, providing housing for two families. And look, I have goosebumps talking about it. And that story sort of repeated itself around and people were both, you know, that ended up being a great housing solution for her. Um, it, it provided some, you know, an extra set of eyes to help her with her baby and all those kinds of things. And it was a really meaningful housing opportunity for someone um, that was important to her in her life. So, so the, the ripple effects of stable housing is quite dramatic. There was another household on that same round of home visits that I did that, um, that, that they had taken in four foster children when they after they purchased their home. They were a couple with one child and they had an extra bedroom and there was this whole family of children who needed some housing. So they took in four foster kids as a result. So people with stable housing are able to do really remarkable things. And, and it's, a, it's an honor to be able to, to partner with them in these ways. Uh, as for me, um, we have Homestead has a YouTube channel and we have um, some interviews of folks. I encourage you to go look at them. One a new story that we'll be putting up uh, later this fall is um, a, a couple that bought a Homestead home. Um, they happen to be Latinx um, and they talked about how they felt um, unwelcome in Seattle, uh, that they did not belong. They couldn't connect to their community, but then they bought this homestead home uh, that's near a bunch of cultural assets, um, food, dance, uh, music, um, things that allow them to connect with their community. And they uh, they said in the this interview that we'll share later that um, buying a home through homestead melt that made them feel like they belong. And uh, nothing could be more touching or more appropriate um, uh, or meaningful to me. So um, I, that's what we want. We want to create communities where everyone feels like they belong and are welcome. So thank thanks. you, Catherine. That's a wonderful closing sentiment. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.